So we're, uh, we're going to start. Um, I was supposed to introduce John Zeisel, but we're running out of time quickly. So I'm going to ask you to read about all his illustrious doings in your little book. Okay, it's what I would say is there. Anyway, John spent a lot of time thinking about dementia and facilities for taking care of patients with dementia. And so um, he has a lot to tell us about that. And then I'll come up and um, discuss some of the technologies you've seen, but add a little bit to the, uh, to the technologies, the part you haven't seen, which is the electrical activity of the brain. Okay, John. bring my brain because I forget things. And the point about which we're going to, Eduardo and I are going to talk about for the next 40 minutes is the way, and the, is the transformation from what's been done for the last 40 years in what's known as environment behavior studies or environmental psychology. There's lots of terms for it and how that has transformed. And we have the opportunity now to transform what we know as environment behavior or how people respond to the physical environment in terms of behavior, in terms of how they act in it and social groupings, into raising the question of what's going on in the brain with what we, um, in terms of what we observe and the empirical work we've done for all those years. He said, hang on, I have to go and do this again because it went too fast. So Rusty Gage, who was uh, on our board of ANFA and who was, gave this talk at the AIA, says the brain controls our behavior. He's also a neuroscientist at the Salk Institute. Is he going to be here in the next couple of days? The brain controls our behavior. Genes control the blueprint for the design and structure of the brain. The environment can modulate the function of genes and ultimately the structure of our brain. Changes in environment change our brains and therefore our behavior. Architecture changes our brains and our behavior. So we're now understanding that architecture goes further and physical environment goes further than just influencing whether or not we can see things, can't see things. So what do we mean by the brain and the environment and how it works together? Well, one, some colleague of ours at MIT, Epstein and Canwisher, looked at what happens in the brain when people see places. Not furniture, not other people, not social situation, but a kind of space like this. And what happens is a certain part of the brain wakes up. It's called the parahippocampal place area. And what they found is this happens over and over. So we now know that in our brain is something that responds to physical environment. The hippocampus in our brain uh, is a time and place stamp for our experience. So this is a slide of the hippocampus of a rat working, walking through a maze. And every cell in responds to and can be, can be looked at as, 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 a, as a place marker. So it turns out that the, element, the most important elements in our brain deal with space all the time. Similarly, when designers talk about creating happy spaces, sad spaces, calm spaces, or talk about people being stressed out in space, there's a brain neurotransmitter corollary. It's not one-to-one -one reaction, but there's something going on in the brain that we can start to look at, measure, understand when we say, isn't this a nice space to be in? Isn't this a relaxing space? So our brains mediate the environments we're in. You're a chronobiologist in neuroscience, but chronobiology. So how we experience the environment in terms of time and, and is, is, is mediated by the brain. The smells, that what we hear, what we see, what we touch, proprioception, the bo our bodies, as well as taste, um, we, we experience them, but our brains turn them into actions, into moods, into feelings, into perceptions. Our brains use environments. They're not the environments 
are not contexts for our behavior, but they influence our wayfinding behavior, our learning behavior, what we can remember, how relaxed or how stressed we are, the, the, our feelings of safety, how our immune systems work. They influence our health. Environment in our brains together work, so they are relevant in the design of almost all environments. Public parks, how they relieve stress, uh, learning in schools, recovery time, wayfinding in public transportation, brain development, neonatal units, there's a lot of research on that, how offices and how we can build offices so that they relieve the, the stress of coping with bad, bad environments or, or with our work. And then in Alzheimer's residences, and I manage residences for people with Alzheimer's, um, how we can create enhancers of memory using the physical environment. And what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about what we know in dementia, and then Eduardo's going to talk about how what you've just seen in the cave might be used as a new technology for taking all this one step further. Dementia is ubiquitous in our society. How many of you know someone with or, or know someone with Alzheimer's or dementia or know someone who has a friend or a family member? In the last group, it was the same numbers, about 90%, 80-90%. Almost everybody knows someone now. There are 40 million people worldwide, 6 million people in the US. These are probably underestimations. The percentages up on the screen come from a community study. So it's large numbers. One of the things is people say, well, I know a lot of people with over 85, they don't have dementia. Well, very early dementias are not necessarily found. And with eight, if, you, if we die before 90, most people don't even, aren't even aware that that dementia is there. The main correlate for dementia is age. That's all we know. There are no other, uh, other correlates. We find vague correlates between um, heart health, obesity, or lack of obesity. So body health, heart health, impact brain health, but we, we, we don't know that we can just keep running and keep exercising and it'll get better, although these are some correlates. The drugs on the market, have, have, have there are very few drugs that have been successful in any way, and now they're less successful. There's a, the, the, the neuroscience discussion about the availability and the future of drugs and what's being done is, is very shaky. We, we don't agree completely, but at this moment, People are throwing their hands up in the air because the medications to achieve the reduction of, of anxiety and agitation and aggression and uh, apathy are not there. So environment has to increasingly play a role. So the new challenge is to provide people with dementia the human right and opportunity to live a life worth living. And the environment, again, can be a major contributor to that. Maria Montessori was one of the earliest people to change the physical environment of learning when she changed it for these kids. In, in Italy, where she started, they used to paint the walls black up to a, about this high because the kids had dirty hands and they'd make the wall dirty. So this black environment we're in was the way kids experienced going to school until she said, how about we paint it white and cleaned it once in a while? And how about we make small chairs and small desks so the kids aren't having their feet uh, swinging underneath their, their chairs. So she used the environment to increase their ability to learn. She said, we take note of all the details of a disease and yet make no account of the marvels of health. And that's what we are starting to do with dementia. The greatest source, she said, of discouragement is the conviction that one is unable to do something. And part of what we have to learn about the brain is what it still can do with dementia. The Alzheimer's brain Ha, or all of our brains, forget the Alzheimer's brain, have 100 billion neurons, unless we grew up in the 60s, so they're already less. Um, and those 100 billion neurons, if you have dementia, get reduced by 40% at the end of the, the condition, which could be 12 or 15 years. So that means there are 90 or 80 or 70, and even when we die with dementia, there are 60 billion neurons. That's a lot. It's all the stars we have in our solar system, and it's about half of, Bill, uh, of, of, of the wealth of Bill Gates today, but six years ago, that's how much money he had. 100 billion is a huge number. 60 billion is also a huge number. Our, there are three neuroscientists who deal with the issue um, of creativity in different ways. One deals, uh, Gazanaga deals with the issue of how do, we, how do we interpret the world around us and make sense of it. 
Ramachandran talks, who is a local neuroscientist, talks about how do we act on what we believe to be reality. And uh, a French neuroscientist, uh, Jean-Pierre Changeur, in a book called Neuronal Man, studied and, and, and wrote about the comparator. How do we, what happens to our brains? How do we go back into our brains after an experience to learn from what we've done so that we change that interpretation? That's the part of the brain that is damaged with people with dementia. They can interpret the world, they can make up stories, they can act on it, but they'll do it over and over again because they have, it's, it's more difficult to learn. It's more difficult to learn if they don't use the part of the brain called implicit or procedural learning or procedural memory. People with dementia can learn if they are put into a situation where they repeatedly do things, as we learn to write our names, our signatures, or ride a bike, we're using that part of the brain, implicit or procedural memory, learning systems, and that's what people with dementia can do. And as Montessori said, we have to pay attention to what people can do. Another thing that people can do is use the hardwired preset universal skills and knowledge that we are born with. Among those are the use of landmarks to find our way, even if it's diff more difficult to create a cognitive map, recognition of faces. Uh, all societies have the same recognition of the same half a dozen facial expressions. Nature, but also touch. So oxytocin release from a baby being put on his mother's, her or his mother's breast is immediate. We now know that the bonding takes place. Those are hardwired issues, which is why in dementia care, by the way, there's so much touching. Everybody touches. So when we leave the residences where we're, where we're, we're taking care of people, we have to put our hands in our pocket. Otherwise, we say, hi, Edward, and we touch each other all the time. So those hardwired elements, including the sense of home and including creativity, are in the brain and can be worked with. There are eight basic elements to dementia design that come out of environment behavior. The field of environmental psychology, which sociologists, psychologists, architects, and designers of different sorts have been doing for 50 years, since the 1960s. And that has, had imp has implications for design. We know how to design better environments, but we don't know why it works. We don't know the neuroscience of, of we don't know the, the how. We, we know that it works, but we don't know what's going on, the black box of the brain. So I'm going to go through those eight characteristics quickly. The first one is exit control. How do we create environments that do not have exits that invite people out to unsafe places so they get frustrated, they get agitated, they have conflict with the staff versus this is one of ours where we, we, we don't do a major camouflage and paint the surroundings, but we have it so it blends into the wall. And over to the right is the push button key to allow you to get out, to overcome the magnet at the top of the door. And um, people don't go out that door. They don't try to get out. They go out the door to the garden, which is nearby. So what's going on in the brain that makes this something that doesn't attract, makes it difficult to remember, or, or, or that makes that that, that push button around the side, difficult to remember. What's happening in the brain when we know this works, but why and what's happening? And that's where what you saw today and what we're, where we're going to talk about in a few minutes can be used to take it the next step of knowledge. Same issue outside. Um, a second characteristic has to do with personalization and privacy. How do we create an environment that gives people their own sense of self, that sense of being at home, and also jogs their memory. So there's a picture on the, on the right side, a little boy with a little mark or a little bit of a piece of tape on it with a name. That's the woman's grandson. And the name, Billy, is the, the grandson. Because she sees that over and over again, this, this idea that people with dementia don't know who their grandchildren are or who their husbands are, it's not true. They, they forget sometimes the name, but they know that there's somebody there. Seeing this photograph, means that in the environment, when Billy comes to visit, she doesn't say, who are you? He says, hi, Grandma. I'm Billy. And she says, oh, I know you. You're Billy, my grandson. Because the physical environment has kept her memory going. How that works is the next future of dementia and design and neuro, neuro architecture. Common spaces. People with dementia in places that look like they, how they should be used. A kitchen, for example. This is a um, we don't cook food here, but we serve the food in, in one of our residences. Don't come in and, and start 
throwing things because here they come in and say, could I have some coffee or could I have some tea? over and over again. And so the staff has to know, say, well, maybe you shouldn't have it. We also have a toilet next door. That's where the heart is. So that the person, we, we, we overcome incontinence with the, with the physical environment because it's right there. And the person begins to, we leave the door open sometimes, so the person can see it and understand and be cued by the physical environment to go to the bathroom. But again, what is that cueing? And what is going on in the brain to get us there? Wayfinding and walking paths on the left, People get lost. People wander into each other's rooms in nursing homes like this. This is the result of regulations that say you have to keep everything clean, which means you have to scrub it all the time, which means it looks like a mirrored floor, and you don't know where you're going. On the right is one of our hallways, and there's a destination. There's the dining room at the, at the corner. So as you're going down the hall, you look at the photographs on the right and left, which people with dementia have chosen. So we know that they can en be engaging, and then they end up at the destination and they know where they've been and they don't wander, they walk. Similarly, ac access to outdoor space, to healing gardens. The sun is a time adjuster for people with dementia who have lost a sense of, of, of wakes or have weak wake sleep, distur sleep wake disturbances and don't know what time it is. But if they get out and have the, the sun impact their nu chiasmatic nuclei in their brain, they can know what time it is, they don't walk around saying what time is it, and I think it's daytime, I think it's night. They know what it is. It's called a Zeitgeber, in, uh, in actually in, in literature, it's a German word for time giver. The environment can also empower. The environment can also support independence and autonomy. The, the example that I want you to look at here is this lean rail in one of our, our corridors. It's, it's a way that people don't have to use walkers and machines, they can lean gently on this rail and walk by themselves and feel empowered. So we have people, and that's the most used supportive device in our environments. How does it make them feel? How does that empowerment change the way they feel about themselves and their sense of self? Two more, one is sensory comprehension. People get confused if what they hear is noise. Walking into an environment like this, somebody with dementia would be completely confused. There's, it's all black. Uh, you know, there's this huge piece of glass up here. It's very confusing. So it's important in dementia environments to create smells, to create visual environments, to create audio environments that do not get interpreted so that the person hears meaningful sounds, sees meaningful images rather than meaningless noise. And once again, we can use the environment. You'll see a, a little slide about noise in the, in the, coming up, which is what's going on in their brain? How can we see meaningfulness and how can we create environments that are meaningful. And finally, residential character. Hardwired, and we know that from, from, from studies of babies who uh, are taken out of their, where their, their, their cots are or whatever it is, their, where they sleep. After two months, if babies are taken away from their nest, from their home, that they are not been told but they know it, they start to cry immediately, whoever takes them out because they know they're not home anymore. That, that sense of home gives them a sense of self. People with dementia are, 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 are de-stressed and relax more when they are home and where there's a place that feels like home. You can use this in design. We, uh, when we design things, we, we use those characteristics to annotate the plans to say, here's how we're doing it. We use that for later post-occupancy evaluation. So when we go back and study it, we see what we did and whether it has the effects we thought it would. And these are based on research that we've done. I won't go in detail to it, but we carried out a major research project for two years in which we studied the impact of these eight characteristics and evaluated them using the same measurement inventory, measurement tools, all of which are observational tools, actually. Um, they're observational tools. They're also uh, filled out by people who know, pe know, know, the, know the, the patient or the resident or the client. The same tools that are used to measure the impact of medications. So we were using non the non-pharmacologic intervention of the physical environment. We studied these things. This, is, this has been going on for many, many years. But what's missing in these studies is what's going on in the brain that, for example, that um, in a a, a personalized private bedroom, there's less anxiety and aggression. Why? That in common spaces that I showed you that mean something to people, there's less social withdrawal. 
that where the exits have been camouflaged and the locks are around the corner, there's less depression. These are our findings. We know that it works. They've been shown over and over again to be the, the case, but we don't know why. The future of neuroarchitecture is being able to answer that question, being able to use the tools that you've seen today to take it the next step, and that's what Mar uh, uh, Eduardo is going to talk about. Changeur, the neuroscient French neuroscientist, ends his book by saying, do the forms of architecture we enclose ourselves in, the objects we use, and the working conditions we endure favor a balanced development and functioning of our brains? He said, it's very doubtful. Now, this was 10 years ago when he wrote the book, or 15 years ago when he wrote the book. We hope that the technology you've seen and the approaches that we're going to be talking about can actually get us there, that we can create environments that support the development and health of our brains. Thank you. Thank you. You can use <clears throat> my brain if you want. He's got a very colorful brain. So um, because you've actually seen some of the facilities, I'm going to um, skip some of my introductory slides. Um, I just want to dwell on the idea that we want to get some hard evidence for what works in the sense of what we present to a person, to a patient, and can we get some hard evidence about what the response is and what the quality of the response is by actually monitoring, as I say here, the responses to the stimulus in the brain by looking at how they, they develop a strategy for wayfinding, uh, monitoring stress levels and the engagement with the built, in, the built environment. So it's a mixture of looking at behavior and trying to correlate that with the activities of parts of the brain that we think uh, are involved or wonder whether they're not involved. So what you've seen is the immersive 3D virtual representations of architectural designs. I hope that you had a chance to see those in the next cave as well as the star caves. Um, and that you've seen from Kathy a little bit of what Cave Cat allows you to do within the, the cave. So one of the things we're interested in, since we're presenting a, an art a naturalistic but artificial in environment, we want to understand how the brain is interacting with a virtual environment and then with the same representation of the real environment. So we do experiments in which we have people navigating in the model of Kalaiti 2 and then walking around in Kalaiti 2 in the same kind of performing the same functions and then we see how the brain is responding to the two environments. Um, <clears throat> in order to do this, in order to maintain a very natural and uh, sort of easy environment to, to uh, experience, we have been developing with uh, the Schwartz Center here and a couple of universities in Taiwan, very light uh, electroencephalography caps with, um, with uh, wireless uh, communication so that the person is unencumbered and can move around without being tethered to a computer or something, uh, something heavy that is, that is uh, impeding a natural response. And then we have to coordinate and, you know, so that, that whatever information we're getting from the brain is correlated or synchronized with what is going on in their environment. So that's, that's what we have been developing, and you've seen uh, <clears throat> the cave. We're able to present visual and audio uh, stimuli. I, you, you did get to see audio, right? Do you experience that? Anyway, so the idea is that we design a stimulus pattern, visual and auditory. We measure what is going on, and we're doing this with high-definition uh, high <coughs> EEG and then measuring head and eye position. Body movement, cytokines, and all of that is coming, but it's not, uh, it's not quite there yet. Um, <coughs> so 
Because you have seen the cave, I'm going to skip this. Uh, you've seen the next cave, I'm going to skip that. You see, the last group didn't get to see those before we presented this talk, so that's why we were doing that. Okay, and you've seen Cave Cad. Um, and you heard from Peter and Eve about sound and why audiovisual VR is important. So we have been developing um, a way of looking at the eye position by looking at the dipoles. For those of you, you know, there's a, a, an electrical dipole that we can measure, and so we can see the orientation of both eyes. And by <coughs> using an algorithm that we have, uh, that one of our by engineers develop, we can actually look at the virgins, which is the angle difference between the two eyes. And so we can tell not only where the gaze is, but also what depth it is being uh, um, <coughs> focused on. And so this allows us to tell when the person is doing some task and with an environment that we present, for example, landmarks, if they are doing a wayfinding task, are they actually noticing the landmark that we are presenting them in order for them to be able to find their way? And if they don't, if we see that they skip it, then we can change it. We can make it brighter. We can make it red. We can add sound to it. You know, Figure out what is the right thing in order to get them to pay attention. And uh, so we can do that with EOG, but at the same time, by using electroencephalography, which is what we're doing here, we can also look at what the brain is doing with that information, whether it's using some pathways which are dorsal pathways or ventral pathways. Is it coming back from the frontal cortex to the occipital cortex where the input is? Uh, and in order to do that in real time, in a uh, realistic environment, without the person having a whole lot of instruments on their heads, we've been developing with, as I said, with Taiwan and people also at the Schwartz Center here, uh, dry electrodes, so you can put them on, put them on a cap or put them on a, on a device that is very light. You can put it on, send the information in, and then go do the rest of your business. So every day we can monitor uh, what is going on with one of these uh, devices. So. <clears throat> The way, the way it works is that we have uh, developed a lot of circuitry has, which has been miniaturized, so you can actually put it on your head. Uh, very light battery, so that the weight is very light. And then uh, you wear the cap, turn on your uh, Bluetooth cell phone, and the information from your head goes directly to the computer without your having to worry about cables and so on. Um, whoops. Wrong computer. So some of these devices are very simple, like the cap, and of course they have few electrodes. If you want more electrodes to get a better picture of what's going on, then uh, this particular device has been developed at NCTU in, in Taiwan. This is, uh, I think, about a total of 64 electrodes, and they're all dry, and so you put it on and turn on the, uh, the uh, transmitter and we immediately can look at what your brain is doing and analyze that information on the fly. So uh, unfortunately, this is Mike Chi who got his PhD here like um, one of our speakers did, but at a, a more recently, let's say. Um, <clears throat> and he's wearing one of the devices that he has developed. He has a little company called uh, Cognionics. And uh, he was going to come here with uh, the device and show you that you know you could do things, and we would see on the on the screen, on one of the screens, what was going on. He w he was not able to come, so I have a little film to show you. Okay, so the, the beginning of the film uh, shows the kind of. Uh, devices that he has developed so that you can go through hair and make contact with the scalp, which is what you need in order to pick up signals, um, electrical signals from the scalp. Okay, so he's going to show you how this works. As you press it onto your head, it goes under your hair and gets on the scalp. Okay. 
and it works actually quite well. And here is one of his head devices with uh, 32 electrodes. And he's going to show you how quickly he can put it on. Very speedy guy. Um, now he's back to normal. Okay, so he adjusts it and puts it in the standard position on your scalp. And what you're seeing here is the raw data coming in on the left and the filter data. We have a filter that was developed at the Schwartz Center which can get rid of all these um, noises that you can generate either by moving, which are movement artifacts, which are terrible for EEG, so you need to filter them out. And uh, he, he's demonstrating that you can actually measure what's going on in your head and remove all this noise, okay, while doing normal things like running or jumping. And that's what we need in order to put someone in the cave and say, okay, we can actually see what different parts of your brain are doing. Um, sorry he couldn't come. Um, so we've done experiments, as I said before, in wayfinding in which we put, this happens to be a t some time ago when we were using a normal EEG. But the idea is uh, to have people go through corridors, look at landmarks, we move the landmarks, we put them in corridors like the one John was showing earlier in which people, you know, get lost because there's no landmarks, there's nothing to tell where you are. Uh, or we bring them into the model of where you are, which is what you see on the, on the right. We say, okay, go down the hallway with landmarks or without and find the auditorium. Okay, and there's a model of uh, Cal IT2, and then we can see what paths people take and what, how the landmarks affect both uh, the paths and their learning of a pathway and what the brain is doing at the same time. Okay, so potential areas of application is diagnosis. We can see actually changes in, for example, wayfinding in people that have various kinds of degenerative conditions. It could be autism or it could be, as, as John started to talk about, dementia. We can actually, because these eventually are going to be very cheap, right now one of those caps that Mike Chi makes is about $20,000, $25,000. The goal is to make it $200. So you can give it to a patient, they wear it at home, they send you the information and they do this every week. If they had to come into the clinic, it would cost a fortune, of course. As, as you know, we are uh, going bankrupt because of healthcare. So this would be a cheap way to monitor people long term and see how things change as a function of intervention. So people think that a lot of exercise is good for your brain. I kind of believe it. But now you could just have people do exercises every morning and then send you the information and see if the activity of the brain is affected or not or one of these drugs that, as John said, are being dumped. Does anticholinesterase do anything? Well, you know, you need to test these things with lots of people and over long periods of time, and this is, we think, a way to do it. We can talk about training and treatment, home design for AD patients, and uh, the last thing I want to mention is that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of talk about personalized medicine you can have for $1,000 almost, you can have your genome, you give it to your doctor, the doctor says, oh, you have this mutation and that and so on, and here, here is the drug profile that you should have. That's the goal of personalized medicine. Well, I think the goal from our point of view in neuroscience and architecture is to personalize your environment. Figure out which is the best environment for you, not for the average person, not for the average dementia patient, but can we actually figure out how to create an environment that, that fits you and makes uh, life, as John said, worth living? Okay, so what we're going to do, I'm through giving uh, a talk, and what I'd like uh, to do now is to ask John to come up, and um, we're going to solicit questions and get a discussion going on how we see this interaction of architecture, uh, design of living spaces, and neuroscience uh, synergizing. Okay. So, questions? Yes. You. 
not behind you. Which one? No, we have six residences that we run, and, and one, they were different ones. They're very traditional design. We're in Arizona? So the, the question is, even if you do all of these things, does architectural style matter? And, and the, 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 the common knowledge is, oh, well, we ought to design things that are like when people were young, because that's what they're comfortable with. So first of all, let me jump to what Eduardo and I are doing, which is to, to say, is this new technology something we could test, we could use to find out the answer to that question? And we could easily take the environment easily. It's costly to do the program. But we could take the environment of that Tempe, Arizona um, envir physical environment, program it, show it to somebody or a group of people or different people, a number of people, and then change, virtually change the decor, change the style, and see what the difference is. And part of what, so part of what we, b we believe, or what ANFO is set up for, is that this is now, we can find out answers for things rather than going on um, sort of common knowledge or best practices, whether or not we know what's happening. And we don't know whether people, I don't know whether people in a more modern building uh, with these characteristics would feel ill at ease versus at ease. I do know that windows have something to do with it and light and a comprehensibility, but many people who are 85, um, 70 and 85 have, have lived or worked in modern buildings. So I don't know the answer to that. What we would, I mean, I wouldn't, I would not create a modern environment right now without knowing more, and this can give us the answers to that. Does that give you some answer? Okay, great. Yes, sir. Things about materials, et cetera, are being done, used more, I know more of research being done on the relationship between those kinds of elements and autism, and children or grown-ups with autism. Um, there hasn't been a lot done, but in part because what are we going to do? Build one building out of wood and the other out of, uh, you know, red plastic and see the difference. Again, all I'm going to say is this can be used. I mean, I have hypotheses that wood and materials and that that really is ingrained, so to, uh, that's a bad pun, uh, in, in, uh, in, our, in our brains. And that touching wood and touching basic natural materials is different in our brains than touching uh, synthetics. But I can't, but we don't know. So, and that's part of where we're going to go with this. Yeah, so one of the things that, that I said we want to have multiple stimuli. And the, one of the important things we want to do is to look at integration of different stimuli. And haptic sense or touch is something that is, you know, in the planning. At some point, we can change textures visually so that you can imagine that if you touch something, it's going to be grainy or warm. Or, but now we can actually program that on a, in a glove and actually give a sense of the texture. And so eventually, we'll be able to, in the cave, to touch, right, using a Connect or one of these three-dimensional uh, 
interactive, um, uh, what do you call them, ways, ways of interacting with the environment. And uh, so we'll answer that question, but we can't do it right now. I will say that in, we, we, we've created museum programs for people with dementia in most muse many museums. And in some of the museums, there is somebody who goes around with them and has different materials in a box. So when they're looking at a brocaded medieval woman that, that brocades, but, and wood would be another, you know, sort of materials. And that impacts them. But again, we don't have, until we start to use these EEG caps or these environmental virtual environments, we can't fit, know the answer to it. That's the, the dream for the future. Yes, sir. So before we go to building design, it's being done now with music. You know, there are learning systems in iPads, iPods, iPads, I, whatever it is, with the, where, where the music you choose uh, gets learned, and so they give you more music like that. And we see huge differences in, actually, not only in dementia care, but also in hospice care and palliative care when there is personalized music, music you've chosen and then that gets added to and learned, so you can develop systems that personalize music. The example that we were talking about, and I'll let Eduardo talk about it, but there, there are several sort of plasticized places or modern places that have at the end of corridors destinations that are huge screens. And usually they have, you know, make-believe fish swimming along or make-believe fireplaces. We could, however. Yeah, so. Now it's, uh, you know, we can design smarter buildings where they are more interactive, more responsive. But a very simple example would be if uh, at, at choice points in, let's say, a facility, in a living facility, you have screens and, you know, the person is wearing an identity RF signal. And as the person comes to the choice point, you present on the screen something they know, right? I mean, personalizing the whole thing to you know what people are comfortable with obviously is way too expensive. But by looking in the virtual environment, testing some of these ideas, then we can say, yeah, this this might work, and you begin to to uh, infiltrate, let's say. But eventually, a lot of people feel that uh, you know we're going to be in environments, we're going to live in environments that are very responsive. Uh, and can be modulated. So that's and again, this direction. is the future. This is not something that we do tomorrow. We have actually two more questions because we're going to start this panel discussion, I believe, and I was just given no, a signal. Actually, we're going to hear a talk. We're actually not going to have a panel discussion. We're going to hear a talk. <laughs> yes. But I was told I should be quiet in two minutes. We have to go. So is there any way of capturing alternative environments that look like that or knowing Yes. Whether that's operating and what are the things that people would need to do the endorphins flow and when? Sir. You're the tech you're the methodologist when it comes to Well, uh there there are limitations to the approach. Um you know, a lot, of, a lot of the emotional content of memories and so on is in deep areas of the brain, which are hard to access so far with the kind of technologies that, you know, EEG is looking more at the surface, at the cortex. And so there are some, some limitations. On the other hand, uh, you can, with a VR, you can change what you're presenting and see what kind of, of uh, response there is. Is there a, a lowering of stress? Is there a, uh, you know, an increase in heart rate in recognition of something? 
you know, you can, you can test a lot of things that would be hard to do by just modifying the real environment. But uh, to my knowledge, although there are a lot of people in neuroscience very interested in the question of what, is, what gives us an aesthetic sense, we are not able to measure that with this particular techniques. People are doing with fMRI and so on. But, but the, first of all, the, one of the things that I'm working on a lot is tr try to get funding for non-pharmacologic tr clinical trials, which this would be. And with enough money, which we're looking actually into for various projects, we could take that question. We'd have to make the argument that if people are, are at ease with, pleased with the physical environment, it cuts down on agitation and aggression and the costly elements of dementia. So therefore, we're reducing the symptoms, we're reducing the costs. It's worth the investment to do the research and develop the technology. And that's really what we're, the way we're responding, Eduardo and I, to those questions, which is, yes, we can find, give us enough money, we'll answer that question. And so let's start using, uh, Pfizer just wrote off $400 million of, because they were working on a drug trial that failed. $400 million they wrote off in one quarter, by the way. This was not a long time. So if we had $400 million, we would find a lot of good technologies that would cut down on, sim on symptoms. I'm making a joke out of it, but it's very serious, and that's a major part of my time is spent trying to add not only money for me, but money for other people to do this research so we start to build up a body of knowledge to answer questions like yours. So one, uh, one project that uh, John and I have been talking about has to do with designing, uh, and he knows more about it since he's doing it, is designing a uh, five or six block area of, cent of uh, Riverside Park in New York City as a place that is friendly to people with some, you know, some degree of uh, cognitive impairment, dementia, and so on. And of course, you can't go there and change the park and see what makes people happier and so on. But we can do at least some trials by presenting you know, a model of the park to people with various kinds of, of problems and then seeing whether you know, there are some things that we might call uh, with high aesthetic value which are particularly useful for, for uh, people to feel comfortable in that environment. I think, uh, Allison, you want to, okay. how's the other group coming along? Okay, so we have until the rest of the people come in, at which point you'll, yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, do you, how do you fix the vestibular issues of well, virtual environment? Uh, so, the, the, there are people who have a lot of trouble. Uh, the, vis, the vestibular senses, right, are your orientation and so on. Uh, and some people can't deal with virtual reality, but they deal with virtual reality much more easily if they are in an immersive environment. There's a lot of people who are using goggles and so on, and those are deadly. I can't even use them. Now, what you can do is you can take Dramamine, if you know, or you can. There are a few things that you can do in order not to get uh, nauseated or whatever. We generally don't close the, uh, the star cave because people get claustrophobic and they start. You know, There's a wall that closes up sense. so you can be in a total environment. But this is a very important question methodologically for using it with people with any kind of cognitive issue because how are they going to respond to it? Will they respond? Will they, be, will they, will they panic? You know, can they do that? So probably that's the first methodological issue you have to, we have to address. In a, if we, you know, if we were funded to do something like this, the first question is, if you give someone a hat that has little spiders on their head, do they go crazy? So, you know, let's fix and figure out how. But it's a very good question. It's very important. Yeah. No, we, one of the futures of the Star Cave is that it's going to have motion. And so we'll have, uh, you know, motion plates and various things and sort of try to guess what, you know, how people are, are feeling. Now, we can make people very nauseated by just <laughs> tilting the horizon, and we tried not to do that. I hope you didn't experience that, because uh, particularly when Kathy is moving around, she's flying around, it's, it's hard to do it unless, you know, you get, you learn. But, you know, as John uh, was talking about money, 
I'm actually want to sell him a cave so he can test things in his environment. And what so would be good would, if, 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 in fact, someone could learn through the cave yeah. how to adjust to the environment, it probably will make their adjustment in one of our residences go much more quickly, reduce the number of staff that are needed, reduce the number of medications they get, because they will have learned it and feel much more comfortable there much more quickly. Now, that's hypothetical. But conceptually, that's the future. Use it to teach people environments so that they feel better in them like the uh, modern Tempe, Arizona environment. <laughs> we'll find out how, how to use this for learning as well as for evaluation. Yes, ma'am. Well, we're going to have uh, a session tomorrow. Repeat the question. Okay. Uh, I think the question, if I think I understood it, is how, how are we going to uh, take this information, these methods and so on, and, and uh, in, impart the knowledge of them and their potential uses to the architectural community, right? So tomorrow we're going to have a session of which I'm part on education and uh, training architects and training neuroscientists to kind of bridge these two very different disciplines. Um, but, you know, we try to publish papers, we try to talk at meetings, and we've just started this meeting, which will become a tradition, I hope, and so we'll be reaching more of the community. But yeah, just to follow up one second, there are two technologies here, and the use of design technologies based on VR and designing in three dimensions is exportable to architects immediately. There's no, there's no, you know, there's some development to be made. But in fact, we've been talking with, uh, with an architecture company who has been funding a little bit of, uh, of this work here at Kalaiti too, about setting up a cave for them, you know, a next cave. And you know, if you think about the cost of, of a next cave is, depending on how many panels you want, it's 100000 to $200,000, depending on how you want to do it. And when the economy recovers, that's an easy expense to justify for a, a bigger, let's say, architectural firm. So we want to export the technology for design. Now, the technology with the physiology and neuro, you know, neurological measurements and so on. I think for a while it's going to go into um, experimental environments, but also we hope to export it into to hospitals where they can actually test designs, they can you know, do a lot of things while actually monitoring um, how the patients respond. So that's the technology. I mean, the, the, the stuff I presented, we, there are, I've written books on it, other people have written books on it, I lecture in Paris, and I lecture in Manchester, England. I mean, we, we, have, a, we have the only course on non-pharmacologic treatment in dementia in Paris that's, that runs every year now for the last five years. So part of it is just getting it into education and publishing it and winning prizes. I mean, it's, it's embedding it. And I think you, you raise an important question, which is how do you influence the design professions with these new ways of thinking, whether it's neuroscience or whether it's uh, research at all? And I think that that's a you'll address it in that education question but we've been we've been dealing collectively about with this for years and years so it's a it's a good question and it's important and i think we collectively have to do it yeah i have two major clinical trials not on physical environment but on two non-pharmacological interventions with dementia funded by nih now big big ones um, for two years and one is on a dramatic, imp something called scripted improv, which is a new tool we're using to engage people using drama. And the other one is books, different levels of books and, and um, illustrations and what levels meet the needs of different people with dementia. So yeah, no, they're open to it, but you've got to have a very good research basis. You've got to have a lot of experience in research. You've got to have a very good research design. You've got to have all those things. I mean, it's really looked at very critically. Uh, and I'm finding there are other people now with 
fun with funding to do that kind of research. But part of it is we've got to get it done, show them how good it is, and prove the, f the, the efficacy in the rest of the field, and then there'll be more. But I think it's, uh, it's all an uphill battle. There's a lot of uh, development in this yeah. area and that is funded by the, um, the Department of Defense because um, That's right. a lot these, of these facilities are actually very good for... Brain uh, injured soldiers. Yeah, for injured, you know, for recovery, PTSD for rehabilitation soldiers. and so on. So they fund a lot of these things. Uh, the development of the EEG caps and the wireless technology has been funded largely so far. Uh, in by by the army and the air force because they're very interested in brain computer interfaces and uh, this is one way to go are we ready allison i think we've done yeoman's duty thank you very much for listening be well